Hi everyone, my name is Joe Barnard. Welcome back to Landing Model Rockets. This is episode eight, where we're going to start working on the code and flight software for the Blip computer. There are gonna be several episodes about code and this is just the first in those. And before we get started, hey Alexa, 01000110000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
So what if we, we could do one of two things here? We could add another turn servo function and probably another weight function. Let's, let's go for that right now. We'll add another weight this time, let's say for four seconds because I need some time to move from screw to screw. And then we go down and we turn the servo again. My hand, this just pretend that says turn servo. Um, we turn the servo again and we just sort of write out an infinite loop of these things for as long as I need to make this work. The other way we could do this is instead of having all of this code in the setup function that's gonna run automatically, we could put it in the loop function. <laughs> and I probably don't have to explain this, it's probably fairly obvious at this point, but what do you think the loop function is gonna do? It's probably gonna do something like that. So we turn the servo, we wait, we turn the servo, we wait, and then it's gonna go back to the top. So all of this code, if we run that in the loop function, it's going to continue on into infinity. This is an elaborate example. I recognize that it uh, is probably just over, overkill, but uh, I wanted to exemplify what happens between the setup and the loop functions. So the setup function always runs at startup and it only runs once. You don't run the setup function multiple times. After the setup, you go down to the loop function and that runs infinitely uh, with a couple of exceptions. We're not gonna get into those exceptions today. I just wanted to give a really high level overview of how the setup and loop functions work in the Arduino environment. So let's head back to the desk here and take a look at our blip computer and see if we can start talking to some of these sensors to write some flight software. So before we talk to some of these sensors, let's just make sure that our microcontroller is working, which once again is that Teensy 3.2. I have the Arduino environment open right here, along with the Teensy loader program that's going to convert our code from the Arduino universe to the Teensy universe and then upload it here. Again, there are more details on this in the description down below. Also, shout out to one of my photographer friends, Brady Keniston, who took this insane photo of the Falcon Heavy engines. Uh, anyway, okay, so getting started here, uh, we've got this setup and loop function, and I think we wanna just start by talking to some of these LEDs. So one of the ways we do this is I'm going to just tell the Arduino environment, I'm gonna tell Arduino um, which pins the LEDs actually exist on. To figure this out, we can use the Eagle schematic that we drew up for the blip flight computer. Um, that's the thing that we use to actually design the PCB. Um, and so you can see here, we've got LED green on pin number two, we've got LED blue on pin number six, and finally LED red on pin number nine. So let's go back into Arduino and define those in our sketch. I'll start off with the red LED and I'll say int r underscore LED equals pin number nine. And then I'll put a little semicolon to sort of end our line there, end our definition. Now we'll go for the blue LED. Int, which stands for integer, b LED, equals, what was that one on? Six, six, and then a semicolon. Oops, that's wrong. Six, semicolon, and then int g LED for green equals two. So next up in this setup function, we have to tell the Teensy microcontroller on here, we have to tell it which pin is going to do what. You have to sort of declare what the pin's purpose is. And so at a really base level, we're going to do that. We're gonna call the function pin mode, open parentheses, and we'll start with the red LED, so r, LED, that's referencing pin number nine there, comma, output. We're telling the Teensy microcontroller, I cannot type today, we're telling the Teensy microcontroller that pin number nine is an output. So it doesn't need to be receiving signals in or reading that pin. We're only going to be writing signals on that pin. And I'm going to do the same thing with the uh, G LED, green, and then the blue LED. So we have RGB, Everyone loves RGB. So now let's write some code to see if these LEDs actually work. And to do this, I will use the digital, uh, digital write function, which is going to write either 3.3 volts, which is the logic level of our processor, or zero volts, depending on what I tell this function to do. So bearing with that, let's just write R LED comma high, and uh, we're going to do this for each one of the LEDs. We're gonna turn them all on high. And uh, just go ahead and make a prediction as to what's going to happen. So R, B, G. So this is all the LEDs being, being written high. I'm gonna go ahead and plug this in. So the Teensy computer is on now. You can see a little light on the IMU there. And I will upload it. Here we go. Compiling, uploading, done uploading. Hey Joe, where's our LED? Great question, viewer, great question. 
The answer is that uh, the LED is actually working properly. We need to be writing low to turn the LED on because it's a common anode LED. This is the nerdiest video I've ever done. Either way, we need to write these low because we're actually sinking current into the processor when we turn the LED on. And to demonstrate this, I've turned the RLED digital write function to low. I will upload again and it should turn on here. There it is. So our red light is working. Um, let's go ahead, copy these things and put some delays in between so that we can actually blink these once or twice. So I will put a delay of 1000. Now this is all in milliseconds, so the 1000 represents one second, 1000 milliseconds. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and copy this block, um, double enter, write it a couple of times. We're gonna blink three of the lights. So we'll do R and then the blue LED. I'm gonna turn that one on by writing it low right here. I will also turn the R LED off at this point by writing it high. And then I will do the same for the green LED in the last little segment here. Low, low, oh my gosh, so bad at typing. Then we'll take this off, high. And then when I upload, it should blink through the R, B, and G. Red, blue, green. Excellent. So. This gives us uh, somewhat of a sense of, well, both that our LED works and also kind of how this coding works. And if I were to move this code, just like the example that I gave earlier, if I, would, if I hit copy here and then move it to the loop function, it will go repeatedly. So it will go uh, back and forth, one, two, three, R, B, G. Red, blue, green, red, blue, green, all right, everyone, thanks for watching. That's it for the video. Okay, just kidding. That is definitely not it for today. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, let's go ahead and try to talk to the BMP280 barometric pressure sensor that we have on the board. That's this little guy right here. So one of the really fantastic things about the sensors and everything we chose to put on this board is that all of these devices are really well supported online. What that looks like is if I Google the name of the sensor, which is the BMP280, and then I say Arduino, Oops, I spelled it wrong. Arduino library. We get a ton of results for people who have written different types of libraries for this sensor. A library is just sort of a set of instructions that, uh, boy, how do I describe this? This may be better described in a tutorial, but a library is going to tell our Teensy microcontroller how to talk to this sensor, and it's going to save us a lot of work. Uh, it's going to save us the hassle of basically not having to read the data sheet for the processor. So if you can find a library for the sensors you're using or the peripherals you're using, uh, you really want to do that. We're going to use the Arduino, or sorry, the Adafruit library right here, BMP280. This is available on GitHub. There's a bunch of other options as well, but this is the Adafruit sensor. So they probably know best uh, how the library should work. The way that you can do this is you go to clone or download. I will just download the zip here. Um, and then once you take this file, once you unzip it, you're gonna move it to the libraries folder in your Arduino project. Um, and that's basically how you install libraries. Again, this stuff is covered in some of the tutorials down below. So let's just go ahead and open up one of the examples that's come, that comes with the library. Okay, here we go. So this is one of the examples just opening up right here, BMP280 test. Before we hit upload on this sketch, there are a couple of things that I'd like to change here. Um, so this sensor can operate in SPI mode, or Serial Peripheral Interface mode, or I squared C mode, which stands for I don't remember. We're in I squared C mode right now. You can see all of these other ones are commented out. That's what the double slash does. If I were to take away that double slash, the comment goes away and that code is now in effect. But if I comment it out, it's just as if the compiler does not see it and that code will never run. It's just like you can put like here, they say default settings from data sheet. That doesn't need to actually go onto the Teensy. So they commented out and it's just helpful for whoever's viewing the code. All right, there's a lot of details. The only thing I wanna change here is I wanna hit enter right in the beginning of the setup and put a two second delay. Sometimes it takes a second for the serial port to actually connect to the serial monitor in here. This is all gonna make sense in just a second. So if I verify my code, just to make sure it'll work, it's going to compile the sketch and give me any errors if I've done something wrong. Looks like I'm all set. So I will plug in the blip flight computer. Here we go. All plugged in, still running the last sketch that we uploaded. I'll go to tools, serial monitor, and then I will upload this sketch to test the BMP280. And, aha, here we go. 
So in our serial monitor, um, it's, this is basically spitting out data from the BMP280. The Teensy is looking at the sensor readings. It's giving us temperature, pressure, and approximate altitude. Oop, hold on. Ooh. I got some batteries delivered for the new secret project. Getting back on track here, let me just plug this back in. The sensor is basically spitting out all of these readings and um, it's spitting them out once every two seconds. So we can actually change this by going into the sketch that says BMP280 test. And at the bottom of the loop function, which is printing all of these things out, you'll see there's a delay for two seconds. So what if we took that delay and modified it down to like 100 milliseconds. So now 10 times a second, we should be getting this data in the serial monitor. Uh, with that change, I will upload the code. Let's just see if this works. Bingo, there it is. So it's, it's coming across much more fastly. Oof, words. It's coming across much faster now. And a more efficient way to look at this might be to look at the serial plotter. Um, and to do that, let's just try to plot one temperature here. We'll, we'll plot the pressure um, by commenting out these other sections of the code. I will pot, plot the pressure, um, and I'll do that once every 10 milliseconds. It may not be able to sample that fast on the sensor, but we're just going to stream a bunch of data about the pressure here. Okay, there we go. So it's coming out in Pascals. You can see if I blow on it, it should change. Yeah, it goes down just a little bit. And then if I open up the serial monitor, or sorry, the serial plotter, this is a different tool. Um, it's now taking all of those values and plotting them on a graph. So you can see a little bit more clearly when I blow on the sensor, the pressure spikes a little bit. And I should be able to, this should work, if I blow over it, because hashtag Bernoulli, it should go down. Yeah, there it is, just a little bit. Not very significant, but uh, all right, this is confirmation that our BMP280 is working. Next up, let's see if the MPU6050 sensor is working, and that is the uh, IMU, or inertial measurement unit. So I'll type in MPU6050 Arduino library. Here we go. Now there's already a library that I like using for this, and it doesn't show up here, um, but if I type uh, I2C or I squared C, it should show up for us. So it's in the I2C dev lib right here. Um, and there's a little .cpp and .h file right here. There's a couple examples. I've already downloaded it, but it's the same process as before. You would go to the, uh, the root here, the I2C dev lib. You'd clone it, download it, put it in your libraries folder, and then work from the example. So let's open up uh, one of the examples for the MPU6050 to see if we can talk to it on the computer. I'll go into examples, I'll scroll down a little bit here, and then I'll find the sketch I want, which is MPU6050 raw. This is just gonna pipe out a bunch of raw data from the sensor. So let's take a look. Um, looks like we've got a bunch of comments up top. Um, everything else looks pretty good to me. I'm gonna install that, uh, that uh, delay for two seconds at the beginning of the sketch again, just so we give the um, serial port some time to connect. Um, and uh, yeah, everything else looks good to me. So let's go ahead, verify the sketch, and then I will get the serial monitor open and we will upload. Here we go. Compiling, uploading. Hey, there it is. That's a lot of data scrolling by. So these are raw values from the accelerometer and gyroscope. You can see A slash G. Now, these values don't represent anything that, well, they do represent things we care about, but they're not in the format that we care about. Anyway, the point is uh, you can sort of see things move around when I move the computer. This is another one of these examples where I think going to the serial plotter is gonna give it a, a better idea of what we're looking at. So all of this data is scrolling by right now. And then as I move the sensor around, let me just compress this. As I move the sensor around, you'll see there are things happening on here. Stuff is changing, lines are shifting places, they're moving around. So uh, these are raw rates, this is not orientation. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of math that's involved in actually converting this to orientation, we will get to that. But for now, I just want confirmation that the sensor works and it definitely does. So let's move on. Real quick though, before we move on, uh, if you encounter any trouble with getting the IMU to work on your blip PCB, I think that's okay. There seem to be several different like permutations of the MPU6050 sensor. So if you're having trouble, um, just drop a message in the BPS Discord and we'll try to help you out with it. Next up is the 
SD card, or more accurately, the micro SD card. We've got this big chunky old slot for it right here. So let me <laughs> unplug the computer, put the SD card in, now this time, things are a little bit different. We don't actually need an extra library for this. I mean, I suppose depending on your Arduino setup, you, know, you shouldn't need a library for this. Most Arduino setups will come installed with an SD card library. So I'll go into File, Examples, uh, and then under Examples for any board, there are uh, examples for an SD card. So it looks like there's just a card info thing here. Um, I will open that up. Now there's one quick thing we need to note, which is this is an SPI or serial peripheral interface, which means we need to uh, set the chip select pin. Uh, and that's the, the pin that's going to tell, I'm not gonna explain it, I've explained it before. We need to set the chip select pin based on our schematic in Eagle. So looking in Eagle here, it looks like the chip select pin for the SD card, that is SD-CS, is pin zero. I'll go back into Arduino. I'll change the chip select pin right here. This is another int, it's a constant integer. Chip select, I'll change the four to a zero. I'll add another one of those tiny little delays here. Delay 2000, you know, this is probably not necessary. I'm just paranoid about that stuff. Let's open up the serial monitor. It looks like we are still running that uh, MPU 6050 sketch there, that's fine. Um, while that's data, all of that data is streaming through, I'll hit upload. It's gonna compile. Upload, cross your fingers. Booyah, look at all those files on there. I think this is actually the SD card that was in one of the uh, Falcon Heavy model boosters. You can see all the, uh, the flight log, settings log, flight log, setting log, uh, FL and SL, those are all the logs there. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of other files. It looks like I might have used this on a drone at one point, so there's DJI files. Anyway, it's gonna give us a bunch of information about the card that we have plugged in here. Um, looks like we've got, what is it? It's FAT32 and probably about 32 gigabytes. Either way, this is great. Um, if you were to take this card out and then run the sketch again, I think it would just say that there's no card connected or something like that. So it goes for, uh, it just like tries to check the card and make sure that things are working, initializing SD, and then it fails. So a lot of these sketches actually do a little bit of checking up front to see if something's attached and then if it doesn't respond within a certain amount of time or if the function returns an error, it'll give you a warning about that. Next up, we need to try and talk to the flash chip on board. This little SPI flash chip is what we're going to log data to while the rocket is flying. I think I may have explained this before too, but essentially the idea is you don't wanna be writing data to an SD card which can shake out or like move around during flight. And because rockets vibrate a whole lot, we wanna write it to something that is soldered directly to the PCB and that's the flash chip. Now here's the deal. I could give you some big explanation of this, but let me try to condense what happened. Um, <laughs> yesterday on the BPS Discord, I started freaking out because the flash chip wasn't working at all. And as it turns out, the library that I'm using does not officially support the chip that I have on this board. However, I thought it did because I was using an older version of the library. So what we're going to do, it's a little bit janky, but engineering is filled with that kind of thing. When you look for the library for the flash chip, let's just go to it now. SPI flash chip Arduino library. It's gonna be the first one here by Mars Marzog. Mark, I'm so sorry. Anyway, um, it's, it's this one right here, SPI memory, but it's an older version of this one called SPI flash. So if you look under the different releases here, there are 26 of them. Uh, look under the different releases. I'm gonna scroll down for a little while. I did extensive testing with this yesterday. The one that has been working best for, for me, at least the most stable library that I've found for the chip that I have linked in the parts list is this one right here, version 2.6.0, Arduino library for Winbond flash memory chips. This is not a Winbond chip, which is why I think there are some issues with it. It will work with the chip that I have linked. You want version 2.6.0. All right, that's my little caveat. You're gonna download that. You're gonna do the same thing that you did with all of the other sensor libraries. And let's go ahead and open up ex an example. I'll do the same thing as the other examples. After installing the library, we'll take a look at the uh, flash diagnostics program. There are a couple things that you do wanna change with this. You wanna make sure that chip size is uncommented and defined as MB64. You also wanna add a little parentheses after the constructor for flash here to define the chip select pin. I'm gonna put that as one right here. 
Um, and then if we go back into the Eagle file, you see that flash CS is on pin one. So that's why I have the one declared there. That's our chip select pin. And then I'm gonna put a small delay, just like I did with the other ones here. So delay uh, and 2000, just to make sure that our serial port can connect in time. Actually, there is one more thing I wanna change here, and it's to change the serial baud rate, which is the sort of the rate that it sends out information and takes in information. I changed that to 9600. Um, the baud rate that they're using here was, it seems to be just like a little bit too high for the Teensy to actually work with or something was wrong there. So let's open up the serial monitor um, and hit upload right here. Uploading, cross your fingers. And here come the diagnostics for the flash chip. So it does a bunch of checks on the read and the write time. It's checking the erase chip function, which usually takes, takes a little bit of a while. Um, but you can see that the write speed is pretty fast on these things, 87 microseconds. Um, you know, as you get to larger functions, it, it goes up just a little bit. Yeah, it looks like it erased the chip in about 14 seconds. Um, so these are the flash diagnostics. Uh, this is some information on the actual chip. You've got your capacity, your manufacturer stuff. Um, this basically gives us a good idea that our chip is actually working. And to demonstrate uh, that it really truly is working, let's switch it to uh, number two on the chip select pin and re-upload, and it should give us bad data or say that the flash chip isn't connected. I believe, yeah. And so two is also the green LED here, um, which means that the green LED lit up, but all of these tests failed. There's no information on the JDEC ID or the manufacturer ID. So um, yeah, if you change it back to one and get all these other changes made, you should be able to communicate with the flash chip on the blip PCB. So far, we looked at a couple of different things. The LED seems to be working well. The Teensy is good. The barometric pressure sensor is working. Same with the IMU and the SD card and the flash chip is responding well. So what else do we have to check? We have these pyro channels here. We have some TVC outputs. We should probably write some code for those. And now is probably a good time for me to show you what I actually built. So all of these examples are in separate sketches right now and it's kind of messy. You have to change things. So what I made for people who are using the blip board is just one sketch to rule them all, which I have referred to as, let me find it here. Here it is, it's called blip test code one. So this is a big sketch that I wrote that should go through all of the sensors and all of the um, things on the blip board to see if you've wired everything up correctly. Um, the only other thing that I wanna get out here is a multimeter and some servos. So we've got some little nine gram servos right here. And then back here is a multimeter. So this is what we're gonna use to make sure our pyro channels are working correctly. Let's just go ahead and upload the blip test code first, see if that works, and then we'll go through what the code is actually doing. So let's hit the upload button here and see what we've got going on. Compiling, uploading, programming, we're all set. Now, one thing that I did add to this sketch is a uh, wait function for the serial port. So it's gonna wait until you have the serial port open to begin the test sequence. So let me move these things out of the way. Let's get a good shot on the camera and I will open the serial port to see what's going on. Here we go. Hi, I'm the Blit Flight Computer. Let's get started. So it's checking the BMP280. There's a bunch of data from the IMU. It's looking for an SD card. Oh, wait, hold on. It didn't find one. Let's try this one more time. <laughs> Let me put the SD card in so you can see what's going on. Yeah, all right, try again. Hi, I'm the Blit Flight Computer. Let's get started. BMP280 first, then it looks at the IMU. Here's some info on the SD card. And here's some info on the flash chip. Buzzers. These are the LEDs here. And then the last thing that happens is uh, it checks all the pyro channels. So it fires each channel, one, two, three, and four. And then once that's done, it's sort of cycling through those right now. Um, once that's done, it's gonna wiggle the TVC servos just a little bit. Wonder if I can get these plugged in in time. Maybe not. No, I did not. Oh. Okay, yeah, you can see it a little bit. Let's walk through this a little bit more slowly. After all of this setup stuff, it walks back into the LED blink cycle that, uh, or a permutation of it that we wrote earlier, and that's sort of the loop function. So there's no, um, this is all just the code that tests everything out on the board. This is not actually the full flight software yet, because as I mentioned, that's gonna take a lot of work to write, and we will cover it in future episodes. So let's walk through this startup process one more time. Uh, I'm going to, uh, just unplug and replug in the computer, and let's see how we can test if the pyro channels are working. 
I'm gonna turn the voltmeter on. Okay, so the voltmeter is on. We're just reading voltage right now. The blip computer is starting up. It's walking through this whole sequence again. I'm gonna test Pyro Channel 3 by putting the two leads of the voltmeter on Pyro Channel 3. <laughs> All right, so here we go. We're testing the LEDs, and I'll tell you when you should see maybe 4.5 volts or so. So this is Pyro Channel 1, 2, and here we go. You should see it. Yep, there it is, 4.3, and then it turns off and now it's doing the other channel. So you would do this on each channel. You would check out to see if each one is actually um, firing and sending five volts. Now, when you actually fire the channel, you'll likely have a battery connected to this battery terminal right here, and then you'll bridge it with the leads for um, a switch or something like that. But once you have the battery connected, it's going to be sending a lot more uh, voltage and current through that channel. Finally, because TVC is life, I'm gonna plug in the TVC servos to the servo port right here. We'll run the test code one more time to just make sure that both of these channels um, uh, can control these little nine gram servos. So I will just re-upload the code instead of um, turning the computer on and off. Uploading, programming. All right, here we go. Walking through one more time. The barometer data looks good. The IMU data looks good. Uh, the SD card is present, the flash chip is on, um, there's the buzzer. <laughs> the LEDs, it's gonna cycle through those pyro channels again. Uh, that's the thing that sort of takes the longest just because I wanna give it, uh, everyone a good time to get that voltmeter attached. So here we go, channel two, channel three, channel four, and now the servo, servo should actuate. Yeah. All right, great. So this is all good. We've tested all of our peripherals and our sensors. The buzzer works, the LED works, the barometer, the IMU, the SD card, the flash chip, the TVC servos, the Pyro channels. Um, yeah, this is great. So everything's working well. Once again, as I mentioned before, if you're interested in tutorials that are more full-fledged on coding or using libraries and things like that, there are some links down below that you can check out. Additionally, like I've mentioned before, if you're a BPS patron and have downloaded the blip or blop flight computer files, let's say you're having trouble with something like your soldering isn't working or your code doesn't work or anything doesn't work, you can drop us a message in the BPS Discord. There's a bunch of people in there who are just happy to help, myself included. Uh, so drop a message there if you're having trouble. Um, and the other thing I'd love to know for anyone watching here, what would you like to see next as part of the landing model rocket series? We obviously have a ton of more flight software to write. You know, there's, there's a lot of work to do there. We also have to design some flight hardware, some mounting brackets for the computer and a bunch of other things. So in the comments down below, let me know what you'd like to see next. And that is all from me for now. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.